Welcome everybody. We are going to be working on a brand new BST class implementation today. So I have started us off with a little bit of starter code here and the starter code is all full of bad coding style. <laughs> could be worse. We could do like a go to or something. But, um, uh, enter the number. Yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, I per I personally prefer like while true loops and things like that. Here we got a four double semicolon. Same thing with while true. You could also write like while one. That's popular in some circles as well. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of threw some curve balls at you guys this time. So the set class is the the standard library's um, BSD class. Okay, it's our binary tree class. Binary tree tree class. So I just create a little um, demo program here that will allow you to insert, search, delete, print, um, and quit the uh, the program. So it'll insert a number, search a number, uh, delete a number, you know, that kind of stuff. I guess we're make the columns here. Um, insert, search, and delete are like the three main things you do with the data structure. And then uh, students in the 12 o'clock session like switch. So I'm like, all right, we'll use switches for once, I guess. I kind of hate switches, but you know, there you go. Whatever, we got some weird code style for today, but it's fine. It's, it's all good. All right, so basically if the user types an insert, then we insert into the set. If they type in a delete, we erase. There is no delete. Uh, you can't actually make a delete function because delete, um, if you remember, is a keyword. It's a reserved word in, in C++. You can't actually use the word delete. It's reserved. So if you want to delete from the from the binary tree, uh, you call erase using the standard library one. Search, um, there's a couple different ways you can search. Contains is probably the easiest way. Contains is, of course, um, C++ 20 and above. Um, before that, you could use um, find, for example, find returns a pointer to the, the thing that you search for, and then you can check to see if the pointer is pointing at something or if it's pointing at end, uh, but contains is just you know, simple life, nice little quality life thing. So if it contains the number we're searching for, we search for found, we print out found, otherwise print out not found. I wrote a little print function that prints out the whole, the whole tree. And then it quits if they type in five. So let's compile this. No return statement inside the yeah, should probably do something about that. It's got some stub functions in here, return zero, whatever. Just a couple functions in here just to make it all compile. They're all dummy code. Okay. So if I insert 10 and I insert 30 and I insert 20 and I print it, you'll see I've got 10, 20, 30. Remember binary search trees are always sorted from least to greatest by default. Uh, if I insert 11, uh, you'll see that the 11 slots right in there between the 10 and the 20. If I delete the 20 and print it, now I've got 10, 11, 30. The 20 is gone. And if I delete the 30 and print it, the 30 is gone. If I search for 20, 20 is not in there. If I search for 10, 10 is in there. Okay. So any questions about this? This little, this is basically just using the standard template library. So the, the, uh, the standard library has a BSC class and I'm just calling its insert search and delete functions. Any questions about that? Pretty straightforward. What we're going to do today is we're going to implement, we're going to re-implement basically the ESD class. I apologize for the style. All right, so let's take it from the top. All right, so get up here. Uh, actually, let me show you the print, the print function. The print function here is templated. So you can, uh, this is something I didn't mention last class and I probably should have. Uh, template doesn't just apply to classes, it can apply to functions also. Or I might have mentioned it, but I might not have shown you an example. So here's an example. So this will work with any any set. Not just a set of integers, but a set of strings, a set of floats, a set of chars, whatever. You guys understand? So uh, when I call um, print on it, note that I didn't actually have to put the angle brackets in there because it knows that S is a set of integers. It knows right here that S is a set of integers. It can deduce 
what needs to go into that slot there. I could have though, I could have done this. I could have said print um, int like that. That's fine. It's not necessary, but it's fine. You guys understand? So you can you can put template on a function as well. And if you do that, then um, you can change it if you want. Like if you really want to screw some stuff up, like we can, let's print some let's print some chars. <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna work, right? Because uh, it's a it's a set of integers. It won't work. Um, but you can you can definitely like cause cause some havoc that way when you change the type on things when you force it over the type that it deduces to. Uh, yeah, so we don't need this at all. It'll it'll just figure out the it'll figure out the the what key should be on its own. You guys understand? So templated templated uh, functions. Uh, basically, um, yeah, nothing. You make a you make a little uh, and to add takes in an int a and an int b. Return a plus b. What would I have to do if I wanted this to work with any any type that has a plus operator on it? How could I convert add here to work with any type? That supports plus. What do you guys think? And a, there's a question like, do the, does A and B both have to be the same type, or what if they're, what if they're different types? What if I want to add a short and an int? Maybe that's maybe that's allowed. Hmm? Put it in a template. I think uh, I like the cut of your jib, Marsh. Yeah, let's do that. And then uh, what do I change uh, these ints to to make it work with any type? Which at all these ints, we got three ints here. They should be auto. Auto would actually work, yes. But uh, this is uh, what I was kind of intending for you guys to say. But actually, actually, yeah, auto. That's actually a new thing in C plus plus. It didn't used to work this way, but now you can say like auto, you know, subtract uh, auto a auto b. Um, who's this auto guy? I keep hearing about huh? a minus b. That actually, that's actually perfectly valid C plus plus. And when you use auto like this, it actually generates the template thing for you. Um, but okay, so um, auto from a uh, <laughs> very nice arena. Okay, so does do A and B have to have the same type here? What do you guys think? What would happen if I tried calling add if they were different types? All right, so if I come down here and I say C out add two plus two. Ada, what is two plus two? Four. Very good, bro. Okay. As it turns out, the answer is indeed four. So A is uh, A is an integer, B is an integer. What if I made this a double? Zero is not actually necessary. What if I made it a double? Can I add an, an an int and a double together? Normally, yes. But won't compile. The reason why it won't compile is because it, it doesn't know it doesn't know what type t is supposed to be. Is t supposed to be an integer? Is it supposed to be a double? I don't know. It doesn't they don't match. I don't know which one it's supposed to be. So if you wanted, you could do this. And now it'll now now that's why those angle brackets sometimes you'd want to put them in there. So that's going to force it to do uh, here. Let's make it a little bit more obvious. So two plus two point five. It's going to convert the two point five to an integer now, and it's going to return four again. Whereas if we say hey do add with doubles like that, then this guy the two is going to turn into a two point zero, and we will get four point five. You guys see the difference there? So it'll it'll do its best. Like like it, it does a pretty good job most of the time. Like it'll it'll do a pretty good job deducing what what type T should be most of the time. And C in recent years has actually gotten better at that. So in older versions, uh, you might have to use the explicit, you know, we want to add ints uh, more. Uh, it's it's gotten better, and there's things called template deduction guides and things like that. You can kind of give hints as to how it should deduce things. 
but even still today, you sometimes have to use the angle brackets and say, I want specifically you to do integer edition okay. um, instead of double edition. Or, or, or you can do this. Look at this, class U. So now, it works. See that? So the type of T is integer, and the type of U is what, everybody? So T is integer, U is double, very good. And the return type is gonna be T, which uh, might, might be bad, <laughs> right? Maybe we want U instead, I don't know. Uh, you could probably do like a decal type and figure out what the type of the return value should be, or or use auto <laughs> and type a lot less. That works too. And so now, if you do that, uh, everything will work the way that you think it should. So you can just pass in. You can pass in the letter, you know, the letter A, and add. 32 to it, All right? So, <laughs> anyone want to guess what this is going to be? What is the letter A plus 32? Hmm. Let's cast this explicitly to a char because it'll probably turn it into an integer. Let's turn this into a char. What letter is 32 up from A32? Lowercase a. So lowercase a is uppercase a plus 32. Yeah. Look at the ASCII table. A is 65 and lowercase a is 97. It's exactly 32 uh, values higher on the ASCII table. So if you want to lowercase something, if you want to lowercase something, you can bitwise or it with 32 and it'll turn into the lowercase version of the same letter, assuming it's a letter. And if you uh, want to uh, uppercaseify something, you do a uh, you say x is equal to x. Uh, let's see, x handed with thirty two. What what what? X is equal to x minus x handed with thirty two. I should probably do that. Yeah. It's a, it's a, or a bitwise not, so you can and it with the not of 32. It would do the same thing as well. Yeah. So that, that's a very fast way of uppercasing and lowercasing something. Can you make it concatenate by casting it to string instead of to char? I don't know if you can cast it to string. Uh, let me see. It's an integer. I don't think it'll, I don't think it'll cast. Yeah, it won't, it won't work. You can't, you can't cast an integer to a string. You have to use like two string. To, to cast it. So you could do like two string 32 and uh, just turn you into it. We'll turn you into a string as well. And so now we got a 32. Okay. So the type of this guy here is a const char star, the type of this guy here is a string. Not the same type. These are two different types, and so it's going to do one type for that, one type for that. But it knows that it knows how to add them. Now, what if you tried adding things that aren't addable, like a string and a like number? Then you get a compiler error up here, right? I don't know how to add an integer and a string. That doesn't make any sense to me. So um, it doesn't. Templates aren't magic. Like if if C plus plus doesn't know how to add two things, it can't add them. You know, doesn't like you still have to come up with the operator plus for it, but it'll just substitute in the things. And, you know, if there's a plus operator, it, it'll work. Okay, anyway, there's a little aside on templates. Let's go and purge that all out. Let's exterminatus these guys here, and here we go. Okay, so we're gonna replace the standard library BST class with our BST class, all right? It's coming up to the top here. Uh, we've got our BST class here, and we got some, we got some stuff in here. But let's first talk about invariants. So what kind of invariance must be true for a binary tree? Uh, and there's, I think, five, maybe? 
So we've got a root pointer down here. Maybe we have a root pointer. Maybe we don't have a root pointer. Um, probably don't. We probably need a node class of some sort. Probably a node pointer root like that. You guys want to see something horrible? Probably like a size t for size. That's not the horrible thing. My size. Um, what should my size be initialized to? I guess thing. Zero? I concur. What should uh, root be initialized to? Null pointer? I concur. You want to see something horrible? What is going on here? Anyone know? Now, you, if you've ever wondered why there's a semicolon here, that's because uh, C and C++ allow you to make a variable of the class type or struct type immediately when you make the type definition itself. So if I want to make a um, if I want to make a variable of type node pointer, I can declare it right there. So after I've gone to all the effort of declaring this node class, whatever that's going to have in it, it's probably going to have a node pointer left. It will also set to null pointer, a null pointer right. It will also set to null pointer Uh, it'll also have a data type T, right? Because we're templating it. After you've declared this whole new node, node <laughs> after you've declared this whole node thing here, then uh, you can declare a variable of that type at the same time on the same line. That's why there's a semicolon there. So you can declare the type and make variables of that type with one line. And it's it's kind of I don't I don't recommend it. I also don't recommend using zero. I also don't recommend using null. I'm just doing this to to troll. Uh, um, I have not heard any invariants from you guys yet, so there's got to be some invariants. I will pause this recording until we get some up on the board. Okay, good. We got some. Uh, we got some invariants now. So, if nobody's in the tree, root points to null. If no one is in the tree, good. It's definitely one invariant. And binary trees are recursive. So um, every every node, now I'm, I'm separating them out. I'm creating a tree class and a node class. And that's going to cause a little bit of friction because, um, mm, thank you. Um, if you want to do a recursive function, you want to be able to call it on the same type every time. And a tree is not a node. So there'll be like one indirection step on it, which you'll, you'll see in a little bit. But basically, every node is a tree. And so anything that's true for the entire tree is also true for any node in the tree. So for any node in the tree, as Marsh says, uh, everybody in its left subtree has to be smaller. Everybody in its right subtree has to be bigger. As Sabrina says, you cannot have any duplicates. If the pointer is null, there's nothing there, as uh, Olson said. None of you guys got one of them. What about that one? Remember, a, a, a class invariant is something that must always be true about the class. Yep. So left children are all less than my value. Right children are all bigger than my value. Uh, no duplicates. And the fifth invariant, I would say, is size must always hold the number of nodes, correct? Size should not always be greater than zero, uh, Sabrina, because if, if it's an empty tree, size should be zero, right? So the rule for size is um, size should always hold the number of nodes in the tree. And 
that's kind of why I split it into a tree class that I'm calling set and a node class because You could have every node holding the number of children that it has, but then that's kind of wasteful, I guess, because then you would have, this guy would have its number of children, and this would have its number of children, and this would have its number of children, so you're kind of wasting a little bit of space. I don't know. You could do it. Like, it's not, it's not the end of the world. I got I got 64 gigs of RAM on here. We're not going to run out of space. But um, that's why this the set class here is a tree class, and the node class... Um, Size is not part of it. I'll put, I'll put this in a way that is maybe a little bit more understandable to you. So in our private section, we've got a node class, and that represents every spot, every node inside of a tree. Every tree has two subtrees, a left tree and a right tree. Yep. And then the size of the tree as a whole, and root is the starting point into the tree. All right, so uh, and root points to null if nobody's in the tree. Cool. Awesome. So what do we need to do for the constructor here? So uh, we haven't heard anything from some of you guys on here. Uh, Surin, what do I need to put into here? Surin? Imagine this is a Tesla and you're trying to fix the software on your Tesla. What needs to go inside of your uh, constructor here? Oh, no, he's, he's alive. What do we need to put inside of the constructor here? Where constructors get called when you make the tree to begin with. And so when you make a tree to begin with, you need to set root to null. You need to set size to zero. That's about it. There's not a whole lot else you need to do when you, when you make a tree. So what needs to be inside of the constructor here? How should we fix this? Trick question. We don't need to do anything. We're done. Okay, cool. Good job, sir. All right. <laughs> you must have data, data. Oh yeah, data is not initialized. So how do we initialize? How do we initialize this guy? You want? You must have data, data, like that. Perfectly valid C plus <laughs> plus. You initialize data to itself. Perfectly valid C++ that is yet uh, undefined behavior. So should we initialize it to zero? Int data? No. No ints. No ints. We are making a set class that will work with ints, will work with doubles, will, will work with floats. That's what the template here means. Because we cannot assume that we have an integer type. So does this make any sense? Equals default. Mm -mm. Nope. How do we initialize something to its default value. Open, close, curly boys. That's how you do it. So if you use brace initialization syntax, you pass no value in there, then it will default initialize uh, whatever variable. If it's an int, it'll be set to zero. If it's a float, it'll be set to zero. If it's a double, it'll be set to zero. If it's a string, it'll be set to empty string. If it's a character, it'll be set to zero. If it's yeah, basically anything except for a string, it'll be set to zero. But strings will be set to empty string. You, you do not want to do this. Um, because if you're using older versions of C++ and you pass in a string here, the string gets set to zero, zero is a null pointer, copies null pointer, seg faults, and kills your program. So this is how you properly default initialize any type. Okay, so good call. Constructor's done. Um, I didn't really feel like writing a copy constructor, so I just deleted it. We're done with that. Assignment operator. I didn't feel like writing that. So we're done with that. So, you know, you know, you can you can make a case that, you know, you might someday want to do something like this, like say make a set of integers, invest two, that's equal to S, and you want to duplicate it or something, and uh, nope. Not allowed. We've deleted the copy constructor, you cannot do this. You also can't do this, s equals s. So this would call, if you said uh, s equals s, this calls the copy constructor, right? And this is not allowed either, because this calls the operator, the assignment operator. Yep. 
So the assignment operator has been deleted also. So you cannot duplicate our trees because I don't care. All right. <laughs> so you just can't, you just don't allow it. It's fine. Because remember the rule of three, we're messing with pointers. Anytime you mess with pointers, anytime you got, anytime you got somebody like that hanging out in your private uh, member section, you know, you, you need to make sure. Because if you don't, you're, and you copy it, then both roots point to the same tree because it just copies the root by default. And so now you got two roots pointing to the same tree. Every time you insert and delete from one, you insert and delete from the other. When one of them goes out of scope, it deletes all of the first one. And when the second one goes out of scope, it seg faults. So you absolutely positively need to follow the rule of three. And there's also what's called the rule of five, which involved move constructors that we haven't talked about in this class yet. All right, uh, but we do need a destructor. So how can we, how can we destroy, how can we free, like we got a tree, right? We got root and then root's got left kids and right kids maybe, or maybe they're null. And we need to sort of go through every single possible child and kill each one of the children. And this is how you get on the FBI watch list, right? You have to mass delete children. Um, <clears throat> leaves, how about that? I don't know. Uh, how do you kill children from root, with a root? Yeah, yeah, this is on YouTube. It's for... <laughs> how do we do it? How can we delete this entire tree? How about we start with deleting the root like this? And we're done. Good, cool. Yeah. Wait, we're not quite done. Well, we're done here. We need to come up to the node here. So the node's messing with pointers too. So we need to say when this node goes away, delete left, delete right. That's it. So basically, if you've got a big old tree, when the whole tree goes away, it the destructor calls delete on root. So that's going to free up at six. But before that finishes, six kills its left child and its right child. And before that finishes, two kills its left child and its right child. Before that finishes, zero kills its left child and its right child, which don't exist. So you might be like, wait, isn't that a seg fault? Nope. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people write this, if left, delete left. But you don't need to. If you, if you call delete on a null pointer, it does nothing. So that's like the one place where C++ is like, you know what, should we crash? No. It's not. So uh, you, they, got you, they got you covered there. So if you, uh, if you want, if it makes you feel happy, you could say like if left, delete left, but you don't need it. So if it's there, it deletes it. If it's not there, it does nothing. And so this is a recursive tree deletion. It'll delete all of the roots all the way down. Um, well, six is the root. I mean, it, technically each person is the root of their own tree, right? The, the subtree pointed to by two is the root of that tree. But when, when we talk about the root overall, six is the root, six is the root. Then it kills the left subtree and the right subtree. And then each one of those people kill their left subtree and right subtree. And it just goes all the way down. So easy. All right. All right. All right. Hmm. So let's talk about insert. So uh, Viali, uh, how do we insert into a binary tree? So uh, what what's the first thing you always have to think about when you're working with pointers? Like what, what's the base condition when you're inserting into a tree that has how many elements? The, the very first thing you need to consider. Before you get into the complicated, what's like the most basic or the first time you do something, check if it's empty. Exactly. So how do we check if it's empty? Two different ways we, we can do this. We can do both. Yeah, if not size. So we can say if not size, what do we call it? my size? So size is zero, or if root is zero, root is null. So if we got an empty tree, right? Then how do we new a new node? How do we call new on a node? Kevin. 
So Root's going to be this new guy here. So how do we call Root? How do we, how do we, how do we new, how do we allocate our very first? You know, it's like we got an empty tree and, and we, we insert six. Root's currently null, null, and we want Root to be pointing at this six guy that we just made. How do we do this? Kevin? What's the syntax for saying root equals new node? Yeah. Okay, cool. Neat. And then we probably want to set roots data or something like that. Root points to data is equal to t. Is there a faster way? Can we do this on one line? Is there a constructor for the node class? Let's look. Do we have a constructor up here? Nope. Do we need one? Nope. This is pods, baby. All right. Plain old data. Also known as the Prince of Darkness, one or the other. Um, plain old data. All right. So if you have plain old data, when you have a pod, you can use bracket initialization. And so the order, uh, the order you give parameters in this are the order the member variables. Obviously. So the very first uh, parameter you pass into the brackets is going to set data. The second one's going to set left. The third one's going to set right. Come down here and say new node t like that. And then it's going to set the data to whatever value. So if we pass in 30 here, it's going to set the new, the new, the new guy's data to be 30. Uh, do we want to set the, the left child to be null pointer and the right child to be null pointer, Kevin? What do you think? So this is the value we're giving the left kid. This is the value we're giving the right kid. Nope, you are absolutely correct. We don't need to do it because da -da -da -da, they will. <laughs> OK, that's starting to bug me. <laughs> Because they default to null pointer, right? right? So we don't we don't actually have to set them. If we don't set them because we've given them a default value, they'll they'll be null pointer anyway. Why why waste words? Why type when you don't need to? So that um, yeah, that's it. That's all it is for starting a new binary search tree. Now, if there's somebody in there already, if there's somebody in there already, then we're gonna call root points to insert asking key, uh, which doesn't exist. <laughs> so we're going to call a function that doesn't exist yet. We're about to write it. So that's why I said it's a little bit, there's a little bit of an, annoy an annoyance because we have a separate tree class and a node class. And so it adds like one level of indirection to everything. Uh, so void insert, uh, taking in a const t by reference named little t. Is this a constant method? What do you guys think? Should insert here be a constant method? What do you guys think? No, it's modifying. Yep. So if you're going to insert it into me, I already know I'm not null, but I need to know. Okay. Sabrina, what's the rule for duplicates? So, if my data matches little t, Mr. T, not allowed. What do we do? So, my value is 20, and somebody's inserting 20 into my tree. What do I do? Erase? I mean, return? <laughs> right? Somebody throws in 20, you're like, I'm 20. We're done. Okay, easy. Neat. Okay, so once we're past this point, we know that it's not equal. So what do we do if uh, the value is less than our data? Right? So that, that maintains invariant number four. Okay, so... If the guy we're inserting, let's pull this up again. So let's say we're here. 
So we're currently on two. And the, the value to be inserted is one. One is less than two. Is there somebody already in our left kid slot for two? Is, is, is that slot taken already? What do you guys think? Looking at the tree here. Assume this is our state of the tree. It is. So we can't, uh, we can't insert into our left slot here because there's something there already. So what we need to do is recursively call insert on our left child. So our left child, so if there's somebody there already, so if there's already left child, then we say left, our left kid, hey, call insert on you, pass him the same value, done. What if that slot's open? What if, uh, uh, you know, what if we were on zero and somebody's trying to insert negative 11 and that slot's open, it's, it's a null pointer. What do I do? Left is equal to new, what? What do I type here? That spot's available, we plug it in. Hmm. What do we do? If it's open, you just insert. I mean, we're in insert. What's what's the line of code? What do we? How do we allocate a new node? And yeah, exactly. New node. Team. Done. All right. So Luke, I'm going to give you the hardest thing we're going to do all day here. What do we do if if t is greater than data? So we just handled if t is less than data, like if we're on two and we're inserting one, the new guy's to the left. What do we do if the new guy's to the right? This is gonna be extremely challenging and very difficult to write. For s, How does that look to you? That's it. We're done. That's it. That's how you can build a. That's how you can build a, a binary search tree. Yep. That's it. All right. Print. Let's do print. Okay, so, so if, what if root is null? Can we, what do we print if we try printing an empty tree? Yeah, what, what should we do? Everybody. Luke, you're good. Thank you for that. That was, I know, I know it was, it was challenging. It was uh, draining uh, in the extreme to work your brain that hard. Uh, everybody, how do we, what do we, what do we do? What do we print to the screen if we say print on a tree that has nobody in it? Exit failure? We could throw, I guess. Um, or return. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so if we, uh, yeah, Sabrina, the screen has got no mercy for people. Like call S dot print and it's like death. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> kill the bird. Uh, like zero, like no, that's it. You called print, and there's nobody in there. You're dead now. Um, or you just not print anything. One or the other. It's all good. It's all kill their family. Yeah, you can always just print nothing. Yes. Or or you literally print nothing. Uh, trees empty. Yeah, we could do that. Sure. Uh, literally, we could literally print nothing. Do that. Whatever. It's all good. And then if there is something there, then we're going to call root points to print, which is a function that does not exist yet. <laughs> right. Again, this is a level of indirection because we want to have something like this, right? Like where we can do something if the tree is empty. Whereas if you do this with like, you know, a regular node, then you're going to be printing trees empty, trees empty on every single leaf that doesn't exist and things like that. And so. You know, it's two thirds of one, fourth, six of another. Yeah. So we need to make a recursive print function up here. 
void print. Uh, should this be a const function? What do you guys think? Should this be a constant method? Should is print gonna modify the tree? Hopefully not. <laughs> so yeah, it should be const, right? It should be const. And actually, this guy. Yeah. Okay. This guy's already marked const. So, so, all right. All right, who has not gone yet? Uh, uh, Viali? Uh, no, we already did you. Uh, mm, uh, Marsh, have we, have we had you write things yet? No? Okay, so Marsh, you're up. So, let's say we call print. And this is our tree. And so we're currently calling print on root on Mr. Six here. Which values should be printed first before we print the six to the screen? We're trying to print all the numbers in order. We're going to do 0, 2, 4, 5, 6, 10, 11, 19. Um, which, which values should be printed before six? What do you think? The left subtree or the right subtree? Which values get printed before six, do you think? You're printing them in order. Left? Okay. So why don't we just say, you know, if if we got a left kid, uh, left points to print. Cool. So we'll have that tree print. It'll handle itself. Right? Because it's it's root of its own tree, so it'll it'll print all of its values. Okay, so we just printed all the values from uh, 0, 2, 4, 5. Now we need to print our value, right? So we need to print uh, our value, which is this data. And then after we, so we've printed all of our left kids, now we've printed our value. Now what's the last thing remaining, uh, Jacob? The right side, okay. So if right, so if we got a right kid, then print all of our values through. Because we don't wanna, we don't wanna, uh, like if we, if we didn't check, if we didn't check for a null pointer, and this is something you always need to do. Whenever, <laughs> whenever you work with pointers, you should always be checking to see if they're a null pointer with uh, the, this being like the one notable exception, All right? You never want to call right points to something if you don't know if it's null or not, because if right is null, it's going to seg fault, right? So always, 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 always check to see if a pointer is null before you work with it, All right? So we say, if we've got any left kids, then let my left kid print that whole subtree. If I've got any right kids, let my right child print that whole subtree. So you first have the left subtree print, then you print your value, and then the right subtree prints. And that will print the entire tree. So the order, <laughs> when this thing runs, due to the magic of recursion, it's going to start here, it's going to print the left subtree, then it comes here to 2, then it prints the left subtree, then it comes to 0, then it says, hey, do I have a left kid? Nope. Then it prints 0, then it prints the right subkid. Nope, there's no right kid. So then it returns, and then two gets printed, then it prints the right subtree, so it comes down to five. And when it prints five, it first prints the left subtree, which is four, then it prints five, then that's null, so it returns, and it returns, and it returns, and it prints six, then it prints the right subtree. The right subtree first says, do I have a left child? Nope, okay. Print 10, then print my right subtree. So it comes down to here, and it first prints its left subtree, 11, then it prints 19, then null, then it returns, then it returns, then it returns, then it returns. And so, this looks like magic to a lot of people, but that is the entire tree traversal algorithm. That will go across the entire binary tree, handling gaps and everything, null pointers and everything, and it will traverse the entire tree and everywhere there's data, it will print it and will print them in the correct order. Kind of cool, huh? It's like magic. It's the magic of recursion. You are a wizard, Harry. Yeah. Deceptively simple. But if you trace the pattern of the flow, it goes like this all across the tree. It's wild. So what you guys are going to have to do during lab time today, because your next homework assignment is going to be involving writing a binary tree that has insert and search in it. You don't have to do delete. So your lab time for today 
is going to be writing a search function. Uh, the search function uh, we call contains, I believe. There we go. Contains is no discard. So uh, how should we start this off? We've, we've done two of these already. In the This is in the tree class now. So how, what, what do we check first? I'll, I'll just give this to you. I'll help you with this. You guys have to write contains for lab time today. So I'm just going to give you this first line. What do we check first? Whenever we're working with pointers, what do you guys think? What's the very first base condition we have to check if we're going to see if some root? Yeah. So if root's null, then uh, so like let's say the tree is empty and you search for 40. Is it in the tree? True or false? What do you guys think? Yeah. Search for 100. No, it's not in there. If you do have a root, then you will say root points to contains. Little t. Sorry, return root points to contains little t. Okay. And it's like, oh, no member name contains exists. So we have to come up here to our node section here. And we're going to write a function that has no discard on it. No discard is very important uh, because contains returns a boolean. And if you don't do anything with that boolean, your code's probably wrong. Right? Should be constant. Uh, um, right. Imagine you you call, you know, imagine you're down here. Uh, return reports. That needs to be const also. Contains that I forget the parameter. I did. Okay. There. So imagine, imagine you do this. You got an empty tree, and I and I say s dot contains. Yeah. Is there any point to doing this code? All right. Like. I'm I'm searching I'm searching the binary tree to see if some number is in it. Is there any point to this code? Does it do anything meaningful other than maybe wait, wasting CPU cycles? Yeah, I'm not saving the return value exactly, or I'm not see, see outing it. I'm not putting in an if statement. You know, like down here it's fine because we have if if s dot contains so we're using the return value, but here we're searching for something and we're not doing anything with it. So anytime there's a function like that where you you really need to be using the return value, we mark it as no discard. Okay, and that means if somebody calls this function and they kind of neglect to do anything with our return value, then warn. Okay, it's not an error, but it's a warning. Okay, so it says you're ignoring the return value of the function declared with no discard, and this is important because when you guys are writing your contains function, there's a pretty good chance you're going to call contains recursively and not do anything with the return value from it. So that that warning will be your, your saving grace. So we can do something like see out s dot contains 10, you know, something like that. Right. Right. Um, and then, then the warning goes away. So the contains function is going to be almost identical to insert. Very, very close, except you're not going to be newing anything. Instead, you're going to be returning true or false. So let's let's come down here again. So if we're inserting if we're inserting um, twenty, then we start at root, we go to the right, we go to the right, we find an open spot, and we now new into there. But if you're doing search, what happens if you search for twenty? You start at the root, you go to the right, you go to the right, and you have a null pointer. So what do you return? You've you've gone to the place where twenty should be, and it's null. What does that mean when you're searching your binary tree? You're searching for 20, you start at the root, you recurse down, you recurse down. You, oh, empty, empty pointer. What do you do? What do you return? False. That's it. What if uh what if you're here though? Like what if you're at like, I don't know, 10 and you've got a right child? What do you do instead? 
So you're searching for 20, you come to the current node, and 20 is bigger than me. So what do you do? If, if your right child is not null, what do you do? Return null? No, return false. Yeah, you were cursed down into the right child. So you keep going until either you get a match. It's like if we were searching for 19, you go to the right, you go to the right. Oh, I'm 19. Return true. But if you're searching for 20, you found a null pointer where 20 should be. You return false. And so the code is going to be very, very similar to this, except instead of newing stuff, you're going to be returning false. Uh, instead of just calling this, you're going to... Let me, let me just give you a hint here. Instead of saying write points to insert, you're going to say return write points to contains. That, that return there is why I was putting no discard on there. Because if you just call write.contains, what... Like if you just if you just called that, you're not returning the return value, right? You're not using the return value. So if, if write dot contains returns true, I need to return true. Does that make sense? Because you have to recursively pass the return value back up. So if 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 you got to the bottom and it returned false, the bottom level returns false. Now I need to return false. Now the level above me needs to return false. You have to pass back the return value that the lower the lower version of the function gave you. Does that make sense? So instead of just calling write.contains t, you are going to return write.contains t. Yeah. Yeah. The recursion makes it work. Yeah. So the lower version of the function passes the return value up and then you in turn return that to the higher version of the function. And then when it when it comes all the way out, it's going to return true or false that was passed back all the way up the call chain. What do you get if you get a hit? What do you return if you get a hit? You're searching for 20, I'm 20. What's this gonna change to? Return true. Yeah. So it's gonna be very similar, but you're gonna change, change it up a little bit. Be about eight lines of code, you guys got an hour to write it for, for lab time today. Screenshot the, the recursive contains. Uh, this code can be found in slash public slash BST lab .cc. And I will put that up on Discord for you guys. So your lab time for today is write the contains function. Once you get that done, you will see that there is now a new assignment because most of you guys have finished RPM Calculator already called Dungeon Delve. And so Dungeon Delve is based on that D&D uh, &D puzzle that I gave you guys last time. Basically, you're going to build a binary tree and search it. So the insert that I gave you today and the search that you write today, the contains you write today, is basically the entire homework assignment. So yeah, do, do the lab time for today because if you get that done today, not only will you get the lab time points, but you'll also basically have the next homework assignment done. So shouldn't be too hard. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for coming out. Hope you guys didn't have trouble with RPN calculator. It should be pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, and then Dungeon Delve is also going to be a pretty easy one, you know, especially with the lab time from, from today under your belt. Uh, do you have to copy the BST lab? I, I, I would. Yeah, I would copy that into your local directory and work on it. Or, or if not, you could, I don't know, just write it yourself from scratch. But that seems like it'd be wasted work. <laughs> you don't have permission? Would you like permission? Yeah, you should have permission. Vim public BST lab. Yeah, you got, you got permission. Yeah, students, yeah, I'm Olson right now. So what you should type is copy uh, BST lab into the current directory. That's that's what you'll type, and then that'll copy it from the public directory into your current directory. Then you can work on that for laptop. All right, that's it for today, guys. If you have any questions, hit me up. See you.